What's up, gang? Welcome to another episode of the Grindcast Winner's Manual 2.0, Coach Trestle. Uh, today, uh, freestyle. Uh, I'm going to open up with my first question um, is, you know, we talked about this before, but I think it could be very beneficial to others uh, that are leading, uh, coaching. Let's say you have a player that has an issue with the coach. You know, they think they're, you know, so let's say you're the head coach at Ohio State and you have some defensive backs and one of them or, you know, says the DB coach, I think, is not being fair, you know, to me or I'm having issues and, and they they're they want a meeting with you. Um, how would you handle that specific situation? I don't I think you and I have talked about this before, but maybe not on a, on the air, if you right, will. Right, right. Uh, I have always liked to to respond and and uh, be able to uh, to say, yeah, let's sit down, but let's sit down with the DB coach too, because so often so you what bring happens, them in together. Yeah, just bring them in together. So often, what happens uh, if a player would say to me or an employee now, "Hey, my supervisor, my coach, um, I don't know why they're not." giving me more responsibility or not putting me in the game. Uh, they're telling me I'm doing okay. I don't know why I'm not progressing, getting promoted. I don't know why I'm not getting in the game more and so forth. And, and I would always ask, well, has he told you what you need to do, you know, to progress? No, he really hasn't. I said, okay, let me call down the hall. Let's get coach so-and-so in here. And because that's his responsibility is to help you know what it takes for you to be successful. You and I have talked a lot about leadership, you know, from a standpoint of one of our primary responsibilities as a leader serving others is to help them understand what it's going to take to obtain the goals they're interested in. And so we call the DB coach in in your example and, and say, hey, coach, have you talked about what Johnny needs to do uh, to move up the depth chart? If so, I don't think he's clear on it. So let's have that discussion now. Well, it's fun to watch supervisors sometime because they start to squirm. They'll be like, come on, Johnny, you know I've told you you have to do this, 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 and this. And then you can get a dialogue going. And I've found that to be the same case with employees, with their supervisors, is that uh, I'm not a big fan on okay, I'm going to get your side of the story and then I'm going to get someone else's side of the story because there's a little bit of truth in both, but there's a little bit of context that if you're not in it together, uh, now, it takes time. We always talk about it. It's exhausting to be great. And it takes a lot of time in communication and you wish you had more time to do that. But that clear understanding with all of us in the room so that when we leave the room, everyone knows what was said, to me is the best way. So often we get so busy that we don't do that, and uh, I think it hurts us when we don't. With the, um, you know, I've, been, I've used that for the last few years, and it's done wonders you know, for me as a leader in, in uh, our organization. Um, one of the uncomfortable parts of that process, I think people are now used to this they, they probably know what i'm gonna say right. you know now sure but one of the uncomfortable parts of that process i think was was um you know people not wanting to have that person in right. with them right you know because they're afraid that the coach will retaliate or hold the grudge against them yeah. for coming to me or you know or, right. or wanting a meeting or something right. like that do you have any experience on on how to handle those feelings or how to prevent uh future issues in regards to after we bring this stuff up? You know, I think that's a natural um, problem that can occur is that, uh, is that you can get that kind of thinking. What you try to do is create the thinking between the supervisor, the coach, and the DB is that they know they're going to need to be in concert in their communication because at some point if we do end up having that sit down uh, it's going to be exposed and so as you just said your people are getting a little bit more used to it uh, I really think it's a 
a waste of time and a waste of the ability to progress if the employee or the player can leapfrog over the chain of command and get the ear of the next person on the totem pole, the head coach, the president, CEO, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have that going on, I think there's more problems with that than the problem you brought up that the individuals are worried about they might retaliate and so forth. Um, I, I've seen problems even in, in higher education uh, in a situation I was in that we spent hours and hours and, and got our data put together and we collectively came to decision. Here's what we want to do. Well, it really wasn't what someone wanted. And so all of a sudden they ran to the president. You know, and the president said, well, yeah, you know what, I, I'm with you. And we took all that time and effort. Uh, we as leaders have to make sure we never put all the people that we're working with in that situation. Uh, to me, that's unfair, and that ultimately will not allow us to progress like we'd like. So, you know, I think of, let, let's say you have a situation where, you know, you have somebody that's a defensive back, and, you know, the, the defensive backs coach or the defensive coordinator was the main recruiter, you mm -hmm. know, of that individual. Sure. They attracted that talent. They sat in the living room, you know, with the parents. And, and then there was started to become some issues. Maybe the person isn't playing as much as they like, but they have talent. Maybe they're second string, third string. And, and uh, you know, you, your offensive coordinator maybe, or you, you come with them, you're thinking, you know what, maybe this person could help us on the other side of the ball. Maybe they'll be better as a wide receiver. You know, if they're wide out, maybe they end up playing versus over here they may not play. Uh, and you find a situation where you may need to transfer that person to the offense or mm -hmm. move them to the other side of the ball. Um, any experience and, you know, any advice on doing something like that? Because, you know, I think that in business, you know, I've had to make those calls over the years where I say, you know what, this person – you know, for whatever reason, you know, two good people aren't really clicking. This isn't a star, you know, over here. But I think if I were to move them to a separate office or a different location with this, they could they could thrive and help us out a lot, you know, in, in, in the other situation. Any advice in handling that type of a transition to not, you know, upset the, the, the coach and the loyalty of the person that brought them, you know, aboard and, and work with them? But, you know, it may be a better fit you know, for both of them if the person was on the other side of the ball. You know, I find it kind of interesting that most of your examples are defensive backs. Is that because you were a defensive probably, back? Probably. Probably. A little bit of bias, built-in bias there. Wide out DB. You know, <laughs> I don't right. – D-tackle right. don't really roll to tight end as well. You know? Well, you, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because when I first got into coaching 45 years ago, I worked for Jim Dennison at the University of Akron. And, you know, I'd never been in a coaching environment. I played, and my dad was a coach and all that, but I'd never been in the inner workings of what, how do you coach. And the thing that really dawned on me uh, that we spent an inordinate amount of time doing, and I never knew the coaches did this, was at the end of every day, whether it was the end of a preseason morning practice, we would have a personnel meeting. At the end of the evening, before we went home, we would have a personnel meeting. Every staff I was ever on, we spent more time with personnel discussions. And you always had the, the depth chart in front of you. Here's the guys. Here's who we've got working with the first unit. Here's who we got playing DB. Here's who we got playing receiver. And we had a collective discussion of how can we best utilize our talent. And as I think back to... Uh, some of the good fortune we had, one was I think we spent a lot of time trying to figure out where our people could be successful. A lot of time. I mean, again, it's exhausting. The, the number of hours you have to really talk through, get everyone's input. What did you see from him on the field? Where do you see he's most natural and so forth? And then the second thing that I thought our staffs did a wonderful job doing for years and years was they took the personnel we had, tried to get them in the right place, and then tried to give them the things to do that they were best at doing. Putting and them in so, their strike zone. Putting them in their strike zone. And so 
you know, you brought up the example of the DB that, you know, maybe you moved a receiver and the position coach recruited him and all that kind of thing. What, what you tried to have out on the table, again, with all of the coaches in the room, all of the supervisors in the room, was, you know, we, we've got to leave all those egos and biases and so forth, you know, at the door. And what is it that the team needs? Now, we're all human. And that person that recruited that DB got to know him better. There's an emotional tie. They want him to succeed. They want their recruiting record to look like they brought in good folks. And you can err when you, those kinds of things creep into the discussion. And where I think our staffs were better, we became a better team when our staffs were better at really just looking at the facts, watching the film, not getting caught up in, well, hey, that's my guy, uh, or, oh, I don't want to lose that DB. You know, I know I got seven pretty good ones, and we only maybe have three wide outs that we think right now are ready for us to win, and we let's take one of those DBs, and now we got four wide outs, and we got six DBs, and, you know, we're going to raise up the rest of them, but for the moment, we got to play a game this week. Here's who we think, uh, leaving all the biases aside, trying to have uh, you know the needs of the team first and foremost uh, is part of the magic of working together as a staff yeah speaking of the needs of the team I remember I don't know if you want to bring up who the player was but I remember months back we started talking about you had a specific athlete that came in that you recognized had a specific uh, amount of talent that would help you by the end of the season you know and and, and the the coach didn't want to put that person in yet. You know, they were saying, well, by, by the time we play, you know, at the end of the season, he'll be ready. But he's yeah. not ready right now. You right. know, I remember you coming back saying, well, how come this person isn't on the field yet? I'm not watching them. You know, well, they're not ready. They don't quite know all the plays. And, you know, right. but they'll be ready by the end of the season. Right. And what you said made a lot of sense. Do you remember that Oh, I remember it vividly, right. yeah. Because I've had that example many times. Uh the first thing we always wanted to do with, a, with a, someone we recruited to our team, so it's whether we recruit a student athlete to play for us or you're recruiting someone to work at your business, they're part of your team, is as you recruit them, you really would like them to be able to do what they are interested in doing. So Teddy Ginn came in and he wanted to be a corner. We knew he'd be a great kick returner, a great punt returner. He wanted to be a corner. And so you always, we wanted him because he was a great human being. We wanted him on his, our team. He was a, just, he just glowed. You wanted Teddy again on your team. He wanted to be a corner. So we went throughout the entire preseason with him playing corner. Kick return, punt return. We knew he was going to, you know, be devastating. Uh, he was going to be amazing. Uh, at the end of the preseason, as we were sitting in one of those long personnel meetings, we were saying, you know, Teddy's probably not ready to help us at corner. He's not far enough along. He's definitely going to be our kick returner, punt returner. But, man, you know, I bet you he could really help us at receiver. You know, I wonder if he would have some interest. Uh, so we had that discussion. Hey, Teddy, you said you wanted to be a corner. Keep working. You could be a good corner. Uh, might help us more quickly at receiver your call teddy said well you know whatever the team needs that was teddy again he didn't he didn't care about teddy he cared about the team so we moved him to receiver well we had just been through 29 practices in preseason you know you practice twice a day you get more practices in preseason than you do really the rest of the season combined mm -hmm. so he did not know the terminology and the formations and all that because he was playing defense he knew the coverages he didn't know that. And so early on in that first game week, uh, we were struggling with him getting lined up because it was foreign language. He was learning a new language. And I remember having, again, in one of those personnel discussions, sitting there, you know, and, and saying, well, you know, how do you think the play, you know, who will get in the game or receiver and so forth? And well, well Ted, the coach said, well, Teddy's not quite ready. He doesn't know enough yet. I said, well, 
I was at practice. Teddy can help us. Well, he can't get lined up. I said, well, why don't we just give him a couple things to get lined up in game one and he'll learn more by game two. And what's most important is the end. It happens to be the Michigan game, but mm -hmm. the end of the season, the bowl game. Um, so let's, let's move in that direction. And we did, and then, shoot, he was a star from game one on. And, uh, but sometimes we do get caught up in what someone is today versus what they can be tomorrow. Yeah. And we have to have those discussions. Uh, another good example of that, it might have been a year later, we had a young guy that we recruited as a safety. He, you'll recognize his name, Anthony Gonzalez. We thought he'd be safety, corner, you know, great kid, you know, fabulous student, great team member. You want him on your team. Uh, and he got to preseason camp, and, uh, and it was Ignatius. Ignatius guy. And, and Mel Tucker was the DB coach, and Mark D'Antonio was the D coordinator, both secondary guys. And we're about through, I don't know, a week or so of preseason practice, and and you, you have to know Anthony Gonzalez. That's why our country has a chance. He's a congressman right now from the state of Ohio. But in his uh, thoughtful way, he came into my office and, uh, Coach, do you have a minute? I said, yeah. Gonzo, what, what's up? And he said, uh, I think my talents suit me better for offense. I said, okay, let's go. You know, I want – he was a freshman. I always want my guys to try to do what they have to do. So I said, well, let me talk to the staff. I said, I don't unilaterally make decisions, but I can tell you chances are the staff will feel the same way I do. They want you to be happy about what you're doing and feel confident about what you're doing. And as long as it doesn't disrupt something to affect the team, let me get back to you. And we sat down with the staff, and, and even though it was a DB coach that recruited them and DB coach was the coordinator who really liked him. Um, what, the, what the individual needed, as long as it coincided with what the team immediate needs were, yep. uh, Anthony Gonzalez ends up going on the other side of the ball. And two DBs that we recruited ended up first-round draft choices as receivers through a lot of personnel discussion and a, and a philosophy of we want you to thrive where you would like to. Yep and where you've demonstrated you have the talent to. Where I was first, you know, talking about that, that you mentioned, it makes sense is, you know, in business, in my experience, I've had some people come in and, and they're either young chronologically in age or young in, in experience, but you recognize that they have some, right. some talent. And the only way to get that experience, which is, you know, how I accidentally ended up, you know, at the company, I was looking, all the jobs I really wanted, uh, they all said, you have to have two years experience. You have to have mm -hmm. two years experience. So like, I don't have two years experience. <laughs> all I've been doing is playing ball. So I come out and American income gives me a chance. And I figure, you know, I'll go there, get two years experience, and then I'll transfer mm -hmm. you know, yeah, right, somewhere right. else. And, uh, and the rest is history. Fell in love with it. I, I see some people coming in and, and oftentimes they'll be super talented. And uh, the way that I see them being able to be ready is by putting them in the game, like you're talking mm -hmm. about. Put, mm -hmm. put them in the game, let them get some plans. To the time, level that they're ready. That they're ready. And then you keep, well, you know, yep. American Income recognized that uh, growing up in Youngstown is worth two years of experience. See, they, they, that company recognized that. That's why, they, that's why they brought you on. There we go. <laughs> so the, uh, so the, the next thing I, I would bring up is we were talking outside about the chapter that Maxwell had. I think it may have been maybe 21 laws, one of his books, everybody that starts the journey with you won't finish the journey mm -hmm. with you. And so, you know, I think sometimes people have a hard time with, with that. It's a little bit different in sports, you know, than it is in business. Uh, you mentioned the example of, of transferring, you know, mm -hmm. in, in sports that will correlate in business mm -hmm. as well that, you know, the minute that somebody's freshman year, they're not playing, you know, the, First thing on people's mind too often now is that they're just going to transfer to another team. Well, that relates to business. The minute that they're coming out in the first year, things aren't perfect the way they wanted them. They're quitting and they're moving, moving to do something else. 
uh, or on the other side, the, the coach's side. You know, a minute that a player isn't coming out as a freshman perfect, they want to cut the person or, you know, or not play them or, you know, mm-hmm. write them off and need to have a little bit more patience, mm-hmm. you know, possibly with that person. So uh, could you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I think what John Maxwell uh, was discussing in that chapter is the reality that – you know, what the, the group looks like today isn't exactly what it looks like tomorrow. We might not be the leader that that person we're trying to serve needs. Uh, it might be a situation where that's not where they really want to be. But I always felt as a coach that we had to have the desire for the group that started with us to finish with us. That had to be our goal and that we were going to do anything we could uh, along with making sure we didn't evaluate too quickly, to uh, communicating constantly, evaluating, here's where we need to get better, here's what you've got to do, uh, giving them the resources to, to grow and so forth, that our goal was we wanted everyone to finish the journey with us, knowing that's not necessarily the case. Where I struggle a little bit with in the student-athlete evolution of things right now is that I'm not sure that development of that stick to that grit and so forth is... stick to huh? Is, is that a word? Today. I don't know. I like it, though. Okay. That right now it's, oh, I'm not playing. I'm going to transfer. You know, it, it started in AAU ball or it started in middle school. Well, you know, I'm not playing, so I'm going to go to the other middle school or I'm going to go to the other high school. I'm going to go to the other AAU team. And I'm not sure we're training them up because we can't transfer worlds. I can't say I don't like what's going on in this earth, so I'm going to go to a different planet. We better figure out how we're going to make it. And... Right now, I think over 50% of the Division I basketball players transfer. I mean, think about that. Now, maybe some of them, because everyone came to the agreement, maybe it wasn't a good decision uh, to be where they are. Uh, But some of them are, well, I don't know for sure if I made a good decision, and I'm not getting the playing time I'd like now, so I'm going to assume that it wasn't a good decision and I'm gone rather than fighting it out. And you look at the NCAA tournament, the mid-majors that make some noise are the ones you see that have fourth and fifth-year seniors, you know, the Gonzagas and the, and the Wichita States and the Butlers back when the, you know, and, and the ones that we expected Duke just to run through it, right? Top two players coming out in the draft, you know, but that's not necessarily all that it takes. Talent is never enough, as John Maxwell has taught us. So I get concerned with leaving before we find out if we can finish the journey. But I think what John was talking about is don't be shocked and don't allow that to really affect you uh, because the reality is uh, people go other directions. You know, I, I, we talked about Mel Tucker recruiting Teddy Ginn and Mark D'Antonio uh, being the defensive coordinator. Well, after those guys were there one year, those coaches were gone because Mark D'Antonio became the head coach of Cincinnati. Mel Tucker went to the Cleveland Browns. You know, that, that's a good reason. Some of the 50% that John talks about that won't be with you is for good reasons. Right. Teddy Ginn left early for the NFL draft. Anthony Gonzalez left early for the NFL draft. Beanie Wells left early for – those are good things. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the team does always change. The the group does always change. And that's what makes those personnel discussions even more important. About a third of our team changed every year. And I think I was just talking with someone, uh, one of your buddies, uh, when we were uh, having that – Inspiring Minds fundraiser the other day that uh, he was talking about in his business. He had about a third of a turnover every year, some for good reasons, some just wasn't the right fit. Uh, how you adjust you know, to that reality, that's what John Maxwell's challenging us. How do you, per- you know, we were also talking about a third and a third. You know, you were mm-hmm. saying, well, we, we knew that, you know, probably about the amount of kids that we were recruiting, we would get a third of them. 
and then uh, uh, once we got that third, a third of them would end up, you know, playing as, as, as seniors. And so let's talk about that first third in closing out uh, today's session. You know, the, the, the first third of how as a coach do you mentally, you know, I think the difference between developing in the, in the season, that's probably a little bit more fun for people. You're developing them in season. You know, we're practicing right now. We got a game in a month. We got a game in two months. We got a spring game. But the recruiting process, there's a little bit more longevity and, yeah. you know, we have to recruit them as a junior or a sophomore and you got to keep it. And you may have all this time invested into this person for two years or a year. And then all of a sudden they decide to go somewhere else. You know, you know, if I'm, I'm recruiting uh, 40 people, I'm probably only going to have 13 of those people that are going to join the Ohio State Buckeyes or, or the mm -hmm. Penguins. Talk to me about the mindset, because I think that that in, in business, that's a long term Thing that a lot of time people they get frustrated with that process you know the patience mm -hmm. of it may not play out as a reward for you or the team for six months it may you may have all this time invested and, and get nothing you know out of it mm -hmm. how's the mindset how would you coach a, a young coach in business or in sports on the mindset of of handling that mental game well we always talked about there were certain steps in our recruiting and recruiting is the lifeblood you are who you have around you uh, and we used to begin with the prospecting you had to find out where the players were and so that was that accumulation of names and so forth and sometimes we would have a thousand names in our bank at at ohio state maybe two or three hundred at youngstown state we didn't have quite the staff to to uh, didn't have the national reach uh, and then the next step was evaluating you know what's their transcript looked like what can we find out about them watch the film do they fit in, you know, to our level of play and so forth? Then after you've evaluated them, now it's time to market to them, like get their attention, you know, and see if they have some interest. And then really the recruiting starts, which is the, the ongoing get them to campus, show them what we've got, see if it clicks, go visit their high school, uh, talk to their coach, talk to their guidance counselor, talk to the cook in the cafeteria and find out if they're the right kind of person that we would want to bring to our university. And then the last part is the close. The close is what it's all about. So those numbers went from 1,000 to, you know, we might bring 100 kids in, counting in the summer and so forth. Official visits where you're allowed to bring them in for two days and really yep. go through the whole thing. At Ohio State, it got to the point where if we were going to sign 20 guys, we might have it down to 28. So, we, you know, Ohio State was a little different. At Youngstown State, if we were going to sign 20 guys, we might need to bring 60 mm -hmm. because we weren't the first choice. Yep. We, we thought we could be the first choice at Ohio State. And so it's an ongoing thing. Now, it's changed a little bit nowadays because uh, it's so easy to communicate. It's so easy to get information to evaluate. Uh, they, they now you know they sit there and they text back and forth all the time the, the, and the, the process of a coach to recruit a, a player senior year junior year we got a year in we've been recruiting them talking to them right. spending time with them texting them back and forth mm -hmm. twitter mm -hmm. whatever they decide to go to usc you know or they go yep. somewhere else any coaching on that you know that coach to keep his mind right you know a young coach saying well i put in all this time for right. nothing well, in, in our case, because the sale in our case is one, it's, it lasts forever, okay? And we wanted for sure for the person to be dying to go to our place. I kind of feel that same way in, with employees here at Youngstown State. We go through these long search committees, this process, we put all this time in, we bring them to campus. At the end of the day, the only one that I want to sign on the dotted line is the one that can see themselves here, is dying to be here, loves what we got going on, and is going to do the best they be possibly here. can. Yep. So whenever we would lose a kid, A, I think we probably had the inkling that the, that the connection wasn't totally strong. Mm -hmm. Very seldom did we lose a guy that, man, I thought we were getting him. I mean, wow, I thought we were really, you know, at Youngstown State, it was different. We'd be recruiting a guy for a while, and all of a sudden, Michigan State offers. Well, I get that. You know, would that's fine. You know, at Ohio State, I didn't think there was any place better in the world at that level you, one would want to go. And 
but you could usually tell where their interest would lie and um, so it's like being a DB I'll bring up your background when you're a corner you got to have a short memory you know you slip one time and they make the catch or you guess one time wrong and they go over top of you okay if you sit around and moping about that they're gonna beat you again um, because uh, you better have a short memory so now you better go back and learn from what you could have done better we used to try to do a little post recruiting survey with the guys that didn't end up coming and saying, you know, what was it when they say, you know what, so and so, USC was closer to home. I got that. that. You know, yeah. uh, USC has uh, one, you know, they think I can get in the game sooner. They only have four corners coming back, and well, that was your evaluation, you know, whatever. Uh, so you always want to go back and study how you could do it better, but. If you die because someone didn't come, uh, focus on the ones that are enrolling, not the ones that didn't. Love it. Love it. Well, that'll close out uh, today's segment of the Winner's Manual 2.0. Uh, thanks for your time, Coach Tress. We'll see you again soon. It's President Tressel to you. <laughs> OG. <laughs> Old gangster. Yeah. <laughs>